Welcome to Risky Business, a show where we get to explore new and innovative ways to understand and reduce risk by bringing together some of the leading professionals in the transportation and the insurance industry. My name is Scott Grandis. I hope you enjoy the show. Let's kick it off. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Risky Business. This, by far, is my, uh, my favorite time because we get to look into all kinds of new stuff. Um, and the focus is always on new and unique ways to reduce risk. So today is no different. And today I'm doing something a little bit outside the norm. I have with me here today, Jessica. She is, uh, she is one of our rock stars and deals with telematics. And though I normally don't promote what we do, because that's not the purpose of the show. The purpose of the show is to talk about risk. I think that what Jessica does has a lot to do with uh, reducing risk. And I think that there's a lot behind what Jessica does that people don't think about and they should. So that is the reason that Jessica is on. So Jessica, tell everybody what you do, and then we'll get into how you do it and what you like about it and what you don't. Cool. Um, so as Scott already said, my name is Jessica Perez, and I am the telematics manager for Care Connect Solutions. Um, I handle the safety program for Clear Connect, and so what that really entails is um, I help fleet owners um, integrate with ELD, telematic devices, or install AI cameras. And the exciting part is what we do after we have those connections and what we do with the data. Um, we provide reporting, data behavior information for their drivers. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much a quick little description of what I end up doing for, for clear Connect. Awesome. Now here's what I hear, uh, when I talk to people about telematics, I think folks believe that telematics is simple and that it gives you, <laughs> you're laughing already. <laughs> and, uh, basically if you say you're doing telematics, that's, uh, that's the, that's it. Then you're doing telematics, right? Yeah. So tell me about Tell me about some of the challenges with telematics. What do you, what do you, what do you and the team go through uh, day in and day out? I mean, there's something new every day. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, you would think that with technology, things would get easier. Um, however, because with technology, we're getting more complicated in how it works and how it functions and what it can do. It's so easy to break it at times. Um, and sometimes when it's broken, it's the first time either my team or any other development team has had to deal with it. So there's a lot of trial and error that comes into play to try to resolve whatever the issue is going on. Um, yeah, for most, for the most part, people think when, once we're connected to an ELD, once the unit, the device has been connected to a truck or once the camera has been installed, that, that that's it. And for some people, they're lucky. It is. They plug it in. It works perfect the whole way through while they have our services. And there's other cases where it just something just doesn't connect. And it could be anything. It could be a device problem. It could be a user error. It could just be a system bug. Um, and so that's I would say that's the majority of what I do, other than just you know helping folks uh, get the data and be able to use and digest the data. A big portion of what I do is to first of all, discover that there's an ongoing issue. And then with the teams that we have, try our best to resort it, to to solve it and, and figure it out as soon as possible. But uh, yeah. All right. So now, now that you, now that you've opened that box, tell me about, tell me about some of the data that people might not think about that we've actually think about, learned about over the years, right? Um, what are what are some of those things that you do? You were talking about units up and down. What what are what are some of the outliers that you've got to keep your eye on? Um, everything. Uh, let's see. So, for example, with our telematic units, um, for the most part, they work really really well. Um, however, obviously, with these commercial vehicles, they're all doing different things. They're all doing providing some kind of different service. So, um, for example, in our waste hauler program, um, these dog trucks are in constant state of being washed and a constant state of going through like these huge, I guess, like washing 
situation where they clean the whole dumpster out, they clean the outside. And so these units, even though they are water resistant, and in many cases, waterproof for like a regular storm or rain, they're not used to or prepared for high pressured hoses being squirted at it, you know, squirted for long periods of time. So um, it's stuff like that. It's like, tell you implement it until you try it, until you test it. Listen until you first see patterns on like what works for certain programs or certain vehicles and what doesn't work for others. Awesome. Awesome. And then um, now how do you, you, you guys have a, a way to monitor, talk to me a little bit about non-reporting units and how do you find that? Because really, right, the key to doing something with the data is to make sure that you have the data, right? So talk to me about how you guys make sure units are online, things are working, and you get the data you need to report out. So currently we have a system, right? So after seven days that something hasn't reported in, we follow up with lead owner, try to check in and see if this unit is functioning as it should. Um, right for me in telematics, non-reporting is a huge question mark. And it's not only a huge question mark for us, it's a huge question mark for a lot of people. So, you know, we constantly have during conversation with other telematic providers, other camera providers, ELD providers, and that when we ask, when we ourselves ask, how do you guys handle non-reporting? It's a big question mark for them too. And and the reason it's a big question mark is because there's no way to determine if something stopped reporting because it's defective versus it's part versus it's been with. Like there's no real triggers or there's no real way to tell. So really what we can only do on our part is to reach out to the fleet owners and get those kind of answers. Um, for the most part, it's it's usually part. It's it's either at the mechanics or it hasn't been operating for an extended period of time. Um, but obviously we do, we do that to, we reach out to the fleet owner to find out that that is the reason why it's happening. Because um, I can only imagine having something plugged in um, Waking it up, pulling your power as it's parked, as this truck is parked for months, eventually you might just drain the battery. You might actually affect the truck. So I can see why those features haven't been built into these and into the hardware. But for someone who handles the operation side of things or handle like the customer, it can be really tricky because you just don't know. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, that's that's uh, that's something that I think from everything I've heard from folks, well, you've heard it. Every time it gets brought up with a new vendor or a new, uh, a new piece of hardware or whatever it is, they're like, huh, what are you talking about? Yeah. And it's I, a deal. Correct. So it's because sometimes it's, it's like everyone is an expert in their field. And it is until you put us all together that now folks are asking you questions that you didn't even think about. And we're asking questions to other people that they hadn't even thought about. Because I know for non-reporting, that's how it was. Like a lot of times they're like, well, then it has to be. And it's like, no, 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 we've experienced situations where it wasn't and yeah. it happened um, in the, from the window of we expected it to be parked. We assumed it was parked. And then now all of a sudden there's an incident and it was plugged in, but we didn't know it was a defective unit until something happened. Something yeah. called it should have reported in when it did. Um, and so, like you said, with these vendors, they either don't have an answer for us because they kind of never came across this question. Or two, their answer is very similar to what we're doing now. It's just like we have to ask, we have to figure it out because there's no, there's no way. And and they could sometimes they have advice that they can like wake up the unit. But what ends up happening? It's like it'll it'll just strain that battery. So then once once the fleet owner wants to move it, now the battery is dead because we are just constantly pinging it, pinging it, pinging it, and then now we have to answer to that. Yeah, now, yeah. Well, we were testing it for six months. To make sure it was part. Yeah, and I think the critical part is like let's let's talk about like crash reporting for a minute because mm -hmm. I think you know those units being down, you know we we you know we've been we've been playing around with crash reporting for a while now, um, and it's a that's a process. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Like what happens? With, I mean, we've got stuff that hits every day, um, and really the goal is to try and get as close to the claim or the crash as possible, right? So, Correct. yeah, what, what do you guys do there? Yeah, so 
that's the main goal, right? Um, it isn't uncommon for what is written or was sent in in the claim report doesn't match the data. Um, so what we're trying to do is just make sure that the dates are right, the truck is right, the drivers are right, the location is right. Um, what happened before, what happened during, what happened after match um, what was submitted in the claim. And so, yeah, when we when we received um, alerts that there was a collision, we, we one, confirm if it was or it wasn't a real collision because it, I mean, here in California, we have terrible potholes like <laughs> that the city refuses to make. So sometimes it could be that, right? Like one of their tires just happened to hit the pothole. And now the whole truck is shaking and, and we're alerted that there was a collision. Um, sometimes it's not. Sometimes, unfortunately, like these collision reports that come in have damaged properties or affected other people's lives. So, um, yeah, as soon as we are able to confirm that it was a collision, one, we go in and we pull reports that we, we want to know what happened the before, during, and after, and just make sure that that is, that is aligned with what was submitted with the claim. Yeah, yeah, that makes total sense. Speaking of uh, California and potholes, as you know, I'd like to do a lot of camping. And going up Interstate 5, <laughs> featuring Los Angeles and Sacramento, Oh my god, that drives my camber nuts. It's like a, it's like going through a tidal wave. It just yeah. bounces up and down. Yeah, and my question is, who's gonna pay for the damage to my car? Well, yeah, you know what's funny? Uh, so we did another. My, my brother's getting married this year. We did another camping trip out to Ohio, and you got to go on um, the turnpike. Well, they charge you to go on the turnpike. Now in Indiana, they charge me sixty five dollars to drive on the turnpike. That was the crappiest road I've ever been on in my life. And when the lady's like, yeah, it's $65, I go, what are you going to pay me? Because you're probably just straight out of my stuff in my camper. Yeah. yeah. Nuts. Yeah. It, California's rough because it's literally, it's like waves on the road. It's waves on the road. The terrain changes everywhere. I mean, California is so huge, right? You can start in the desert, end up by the beach, be up in the mountains. And, and yeah, like out here, we see a lot of, like there's certain areas that are known for like having a lot of semis come through. And the holes that they leave on the ground are insane. Huge, huge holes. And sometimes you just have to drive through it. There's traffic. You're not going to all of a sudden catch it and then go into the next lane. You just drive right through it. And the whole time you're just apologizing to yourself and your passenger because you're like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There's like, you. I just want someone to repair my suspension. <laughs> That's all it is. Yeah, I know, right? Imagine like, this camper bouncing around. I got stuff all in it. I mean, it's nuts. But now you fast forward that over to the crash reporting like that. Pinpointing an actual crash is a difficult task. I mean, I know you guys have done a lot of work already, but it's it's hard. It's hard. Um, and there's some new technology that's out there that we've looked at already. Hopefully we'll be coming around uh, where it actually has um, microphones Uh inside of the piece of hardware. Um, so now not only are you getting the access movement, but you're getting the sound of the crash, which hopefully will start to get an even even more precise. So that's coming. That'll be another new fun thing for you to, to work with. Yeah, and if you like the report, like the great thing about the crash reportings is that we're really close to where like the collision occurred. Um, sometimes when you open the report, you could almost predict what happened. Like I just got one yesterday where like it pinpoint the collision um for the truck driver that was gonna make the left turn. So you can ar you can already picture it, right? Like he's making his left turn and probably someone either t like T boned him or he hit somebody. So that you can just almost like picture it in your mind, like what occurred, when did it occur? And then also time of day. There's times where um like, well, I see a collision that happened on the freeway. And sure, it's Google Maps. They took photos probably months ago. But you can see that the highway is crammed. So you know, okay, this is high traffic highway. Probably what happened was that the traffic stopped and he ended up hitting someone. And then you read the report and you feel almost psychic. You're like, yeah, it's exactly what I thought. Was happening. Um, so, yeah, it's just bringing all this information together to just try to get it as accurate as possible. Um, just to make sure everyone is that's awesome. All right. Now we're going to go into a fun one. AI cameras. So you've been dealing with this now. This is a new one, right? This is a new one. Um, yeah. I think it's spectacular. 
tell me, tell me, uh, what you've learned. Uh, tell me what the fleets like and don't like when you talk to them and tell me what you think the future of the AI camp. Oh, those are big questions. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Before you answer, did you watch the podcast with Flint and I? No, I haven't had a chance. But oh my God, you got to watch it. He literally <laughs> told a story about a guy that pulled out a walk on a hot plate and was driving while he was cooking and then ate stir fry. Yeah, I, I think we need to get more cameras out there so I can find my. <laughs> but, but the whole story, he goes. He goes, the funny thing is, the guy didn't even leave the lane. Like, he drove perfectly the whole, whole time. And how are you going to yell at him? He's eating healthy, and he's driving safe. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Anyways, go ahead. Tell me your story. You got to listen to that one. I, I must. I, I'll listen to it right after this. Um, yeah, I've learned a lot with the AI cameras. Um, one thing that for sure I hear a lot about, because we're, we're using truck spike cameras, which are like advanced AI, AI cameras. And one of the biggest notes from folks who had cameras before and now went into Truck Spy was the video quality. Uh, so that's something new for me because I, I don't use cameras in my own personal vehicle. Um, this is really like one of the first vendors that we've actually put the hardware in and sell the footage ourselves um, that are now finding out that the quality just isn't there for other camera providers. And the names that I've heard have been from pretty big uh, slash ELD providers, which to me was a little shocking to hear that. Oh, okay, the video quality for this, the, from this provider, it just isn't matching up to these like tr tricks by AI camera. Um, and one of the other things is like you don't have to sit there and watch hours of footage. You know, you don't you don't sit there and be like, okay, well my driver drove twelve hours. I gotta like forward through the whole video and see what he was doing. Um, these cameras are really sophisticated where it'll detect what it is, what is the violation, right? Are they texting? Or do they look sleepy? Um, did they run a red light? Like it'll actually detect it and create these like really what I'd consider like convenient 10 second videos that you can just view and see what is heard before, middle and after. Um, you can filter out ones that aren't like actual video alerts, you know, things that might've just, it might've been a shadow. It might've been something that detected incorrectly. Um, but the, the most exciting thing for me as far as like what I look for, what I handle on the day to day, um, it's just to see that the habit that needs to be corrected for a driver is only like one habit. Yeah. So it's not like what I've noticed. It's like I usually don't. So I one of the popular ones is obviously screen. Um running either red lights or yellow lights like running it too close or like texting and driving and i have yet to see one driver do all three it's usually like one driver has an issue with always having his phone in his hand and like talking and just driving and talking with their phone like this the whole time um then i'll see another driver where it's like i just noticed it was like traffic violation traffic violation checks and each one was like he rolled stop he rolled a stop at a stop sign. He rolled through a red light. He like was cutting it really close on a yellow light. And so what I think is exciting about that is that you don't like your driver doesn't have to start from scratch. Like it isn't like they're all bad drivers. It isn't like they all like they're always doing they're always grilling. Um, it's just that every once in a while they probably have habits that they're just not conscious. I, and I know, I'm sure if I installed the camera or I installed a telematic unit, I would quickly find out what, like, it's very, I, 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 I would I, find out what is things that I do that I just like, oh, I, I thought I do it every once in a while. And in reality, I'm doing it every single time I drive. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, when we started this whole thing, I had a telematic unit in my truck. It was, uh, it was, it was pretty scary. <laughs> I should not. I should not be on the road. Or you met, you know, it's like it's defective. It's wrong. You know, the, <laughs> Something's wrong with this unit. There's no way I went ninety pulling my camper. Yes, and you know what? It's always the like it's always the drivers that know they perform bad who argue the data. It's all them. Like they'll call you about this one instance where they're like going eighty five, and they're like, "That's wrong." Like. 
you know, right here, I'm able to drive 80 and I don't know why I got speeding. And I'm like, okay, great. So this one is not accurate. But what about the other thousand incidents that occurred in the month? Like, we're just talking about one. What about all the other one? Um, so, yeah, it's always someone's always going to argue the data. Someone's always going to fight it. Um, I had this one account where this driver was was the driver for this company for like, I don't know. She's mentioned a long time, like 10, 15 years. And she's like, I don't know. I feel like ever since I got this data, like you guys t- like saying that my driver isn't good, but I've had him for so long. Like he's a great driver. Something's wrong with the unit. OK, fine. You know, if that's how you feel about it, this is data. Do what you want with it. Then this the driver decided to retire. She brings in another driver literally night and day night and day she like got a hold of me and she's like now the reporting is good what is this what does this mean and i'm like well your new driver is a safer driver right like new driver is not isn't speeding isn't you know doing all these other things and i asked her has like has anything changed as far as like making it to the load on time like have you had any issues with with him being arrived to places on time and she's like no actually like he's great like I I don't have to like manage him micromanage him and it's just showing that it's like sometimes like our the way someone drives on the road can be a reflection of how they perform in all aspects of their work environment oh yeah Um, and so it was really nice to see where suddenly it's like sometimes just switching the driver or switching the truck I had someone who went from a 1993 Peterbilt to a 2023 Peterbilt that reporting got better and I'm sure it's because he saw the huge price tag on Uh, uh, that I'm not gonna drive it how I drove that old thing uh uh, I'm sure that that's what happened um again night and day driver didn't change nothing changed literally from a 1993 to 2023 truck and it's just oh, yeah. seeing the value and respecting the truck, which is like yeah. what changed his habit. I'm sure he's like, you better not crash this truck. <laughs> like, <laughs> done. Uh, that's funny. Like, so those are examples where it's just like people will always challenge the reporting. Um, and then they quickly start to learn when there's a change. Like, they themselves answer their own question. And like, oh, is it accurate? Oh, it is. Because this happened and I see that it's aligning with the data. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So now I'm going to ask you some questions. And for everybody that listens to this, this is always unscripted, so I have no idea what the answers are. They can be whatever they are. <laughs> so what what is the favorite, what's your favorite part of what you do? Oh, talking to the drivers. Yeah. Talking to the drivers. Because what Flint witnesses is what I hear on the phone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like when I talk to these drivers, the thing, the stories that they tell me, uh, the issues that they have to deal with almost feel like an episode of like The Office or something. It's so wrong <laughs> that you're like, what? You had to do what? And it's like, it's just because they're you know they're on the road for most of their life. Like the, these drivers drive for eight plus hours and like have no communication with anyone. So the moment you call them to ask them a question about a telematic unit, then they'll start telling you about their day before their day their day before the month before whatever issues they've had to deal with um and for me it's just very informative because i am i'm not a driver i don't i've never even stepped inside of a peterbilt truck or an or a man i've never done that so um i don't know i can assume what the life is the lifestyle is like i can assume what what they need i can assume what they want um but I don't know until I hear it. And the only way I can find that out is by making the time to talk to them. Um, Cause I'm not going to hear it in the first conversation, but I'll hear it on the second, hear it on the third one. Um, it also helps with setting expectations. So for example, you know, how I, we were talking about the non-reporting, um, I was following up with these trucks in the shop on a weekly basis, not knowing that the average time to repair one of these tr- trucks has been three months or more. Like it was a waste of time for me and it was a waste for, of time for them. I'm thinking it's like a regular 
Honda that you take to your mechanic and in a couple of weeks he's got it up and running, not knowing that these parts have to be aftermarket and they have to be shipped from this country and arrived here and then it's stalled and it's a computer and they don't have a chip. And it's like, I don't learn these things until I'm talking to these drivers. And like I said, one, hearing what they need is essential to what I do. And two, um, setting realistic expectations of what it is that they do and like how we can service that without like overwhelming them because my expectations are from what I understand and it's very little in comparison to like, what they know and what they know about the industry. Every day is learning. Huh? Every now- day. Every day is learning. I'm always learning something new. I you have to be you have to be ready to change and grow and like get rid of what you thought you knew and like learn something totally different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, every day. That's the fun part. At least it's consistent, right? You know that consistently it's going to change. The chaos is consistent. For sure. There's no greater than that. <laughs> <laughs> now, listen, so we learned some stuff too. Talk about some recent stuff with um, theft. Okay. And I think people, in my mind, they always think that telematics is about speeding, braking, hard turns, harsh events, collisions, and all this stuff, which it is. But why don't you talk about some of the recent things that we had go on with some of the fleets? Yeah. Um, so we had a fleet that contacted me Monday morning, not not this Monday, but like a couple months back. Um, and she was like in a frantic state was like, we went to go pick up our truck this morning. It's gone. And, um, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, she was one of the folks that was extremely resistant about the telematic unit installing. Didn't really want to do it. And now she said, he is like, when did you send me the email to set up my account to view my data and like just wanted to be able to see if, if they can see any information on it. Um, so yeah, so right away, like I started pulling reports on it. I started, uh, I sent her the last reported location and just to get her like that portion of it going. Um, and yeah, so, so I ran through the whole thing. So I was like, okay, I see that it was parked at a church parking lot on Friday. Does that sound right to you she goes yeah that, that's good that's where we left it and i was like saturday morning 3 a.m it was powered up and it started driving and she's like that's not us like well that's not us um because there was also they were suspicious that it was towed but it wouldn't have powered up if it had been towed so so we knew right away okay someone had to have gone inside somehow gotten inside powered it up and like driven it out of the parking lot um, and so it was parked inside of a junkyard, like a, like a mechanic slash like junkyard plane, um, for most of Saturday. But then the weird thing is that I saw that it moved 25 miles and I was like, okay, so from when it got to the shop, it left the shop, but it came back. To the shop. And like, that was just a huge question mark. Cause for me, I was like, I'd imagine that this truck would be halfway down to Mexico. You know, after it was stolen, like you're trying to hide it, right? But in reality, it's like they moved it around and they brought it back. Um, so then I noticed that it actually traveled to a different mechanic shop. And so it like, it was taken there Saturday morning, driven to this new shop, brought back. But in that shop, it was powered on like 20, 30 times. Like it was turning it off, turning it off. Turning it on, turning it, turning like just constantly. So when they finally showed up with the police, because she called me back after, she's like, "Where you said it was is exactly where it was parked." And I told her, I was like, "It's gonna be parked in the back because you could see the lot, like from like Google Maps." I was like, "It's gonna be parked in the back, right next to a huge tree, because you could see that there was a tree on the map, and the dot was right under the tree." He's like, yep, it was in that right side corner, parked under a large tree, and she said that her truck was unrecognizable. Wow. Recognizable. She said that the only way they matched it was through the VIN because they had scraped off the decals, they had removed parts, they had swapped, like literally like everything that could possibly be removed and swapped out for something cheaper, broken, dented, like it, they did it. 
And they did it all from like Saturday to Sunday wow. until they discovered it. And so um, one of the things that I think is probably happening in these like theft situations is that I think they're paying attention to people's pattern. There's one thing that I noticed she said, she goes, we park it there every Friday. We park it there every Friday. And the shop where it reported first and last was only seven miles away. Wow. Which for me, like I said, I would imagine in my mind, based on movies, when you steal something, you're out of there. You're in another state. You're in another country. No, you're right. You're, you're in their backyard. It's just hidden in the tree in the backyard. You just don't know it's there. It could be anywhere um so even though they scraped everything they did not scrape the little black box they couldn't put the battery like adam must have thought this battery is no more than a few hundred bucks leave it we'll get more for the computer we'll get more for the tires we'll get more for this not knowing that that little black box was pinging its location uh, 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 uh. <laughs> trying to do this whole thing um and yeah and and so it was it was unfortunate because the damage was done right like they don't make it done but they were able to retrieve something they were able to now like hopefully if it's a chop shop like at least be suspicious of these folks that are like oh you have you didn't know that someone brought you a peterbilt and parked it in the back of your lot like you somehow that flipped your mind this morning you didn't notice that someone drove it and parked it in the back like you know i mean i'm just hoping that this is the start of catching one of many um what i'm glad i hope they didn't mention the unit (laughs) (laughs) they'll get smarter next time next one they're gonna check the like check the batteries check the (laughs) um but we'll get smarter we'll like put it under the fender or something um but yeah, so that like that was a situation where we were able to relocate the unit. Um, they were able to retrieve it, you know, file a report. But I've had silly ones where they call me and they're like, my truck is missing and you find it. And I'm like, it's not reporting in. Like, like you know, my last conversation with you was that you were going to install it on Friday. And they're like, oh, the unit's at my kitchen table. Uh. What can you do now? Well, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> and I just sat there like, of course not. It, it's on, I can track you to your kitchen table. That's what I can do. Is I can track you to your kitchen table. And yeah, it was just like, he was like desperate in the hopes of somehow miraculously like that unit. Connected. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had a combination of things where it's like, we can't track something that isn't connected. We cannot track yeah. something um, that you didn't complete. Um, but for the most part, if they don't know about it, we can catch them rather quickly. I just think that they knew that they weren't going to come back until Monday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's cool. That's that's an awesome. See that now that when we talk about risk, you know, I I I actually use that story a lot when I talk to people because I think it's important that people think outside the box. <laughs> when it comes to telematics, it's not just about speed, brake, harsh events. There's definitely stuff to be learned there, but there's more to be learned about how do we start to get closer to the crash? How do we scare, start to get closer to the, to the location? How do we find out even, like I say this to people too, even if we don't have data because somebody, we've been chasing them because their unit's disconnected. Well, if they're the ones that have trucks stolen and we can't see them, or they're the ones that have more crashes, um, maybe there's a reason. They're hiding. You know what I mean? So I think there's more that we're going to learn. I'm excited about it. So last thing. This is the last question. Again, I have no idea what you're going to say here. What's your funniest story? Oh, Lord. <laughs> I not get one. Um, well, I don't know if it's my funniest, but it's one of my favorites because it just tells you how long Oh, I won't even in this industry for five years, but I've dealt with a lot, a lot of drivers and I'm like very familiar with their habits and their behaviors and like it, they, they are a niche market. Right. Uh, so we've 
what what we do is like some folks are happy to comply with like telematics. They're all about safety, and there's some people that just hate all about. They're like, I'm doing it because I must, not because I want to. And they tell you that. Um, I had one of our um, Stephanie that works with me. She like contacted me, and she felt so bad. She's like, I was talking to this driver, and I was really trying to be helpful and patient, but he lost it. He was like upset and he had to do it that you know he feels like he is too complicated he can't figure it out and like disconnected the phone halfway through her conversation and i was like without like second guessing it i go no don't worry about it in two days the wife's gonna call you (laughs) call you and she's gonna ask you what is it that you need and she's like, well, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just nervous because, you know, it, like we don't really experience that too often. And in two days, uh, then it be a chat saying, I'm on the phone with the wife. Uh, 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 <laughs> and I was like, that's what it comes down to with, with some of our drivers. It's like they don't have the patience. They get overwhelmed. They emotionally cannot handle this like complex thing, I guess, that we're asking from them. And then before you know it, the wife comes in and it's like, let me call her. Let me figure it out. If you can become friends with the wife, you can make anything happen. <laughs> I always see that. Um, it was so funny. And then and then sometimes it'll happen too where the wife will call us and be like, you know, this 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 service was canceled. This was, you know, what or you know, we're we're our insurance is canceling, what's going on? And I'll say, yeah, you know, I spoke to Robert for two weeks. You know, I told him this is what needed to happen. And and this is why the cancellation is in place. And then you'll literally hear go, Robert, is it true that she talked to you 32 times about this? And then you'll hear Robert like. (laughs) And then she's like, well, what do we need to do? I am so sorry, ma'am. I didn't know about it. He just told me that it was canceling. I had no idea that you already talked to him. But it, it's just like that was a concept for me. Like I uh, always like I almost want to be like, is your wife available? Can I talk to your wife? Uh, Can we get this heard it out because oh yeah, they're silly. See that? And you know what this is? This is yet another example that women are the more powerful species. That's it. It's all true. It's all true. <laughs> it's like on the phone with them, it's like you can't tell me nothing. And then he calls you, and she's like, "You better do it." And he's like, "I'm doing it. I'm watching." <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, good stuff. All right. Well, listen, Jessica, this was fun. Did you have fun? <laughs> See, you were, you were nervous, right? You were nervous. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. Listen, thanks for doing this. I think this is going to be a good one. I really hope people. Uh, I really hope that they pay attention to what telematics can really do. I think it's powerful. And we're learning new ways every day to use the data, uh, which is cool. So, all right. Well, listen, thanks a lot. Be good. I hope you enjoyed our show today. Remember, when it comes to creativity and innovation, I always like to quote one of my favorite lines out of the movie Tommy Boy. If you ain't growing, you're dying. There ain't no third direction. My name's Scott Grandis. I'll see you on the next show. Peace.